everybody. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford, and when I'm not recording this podcast or writing about all things nutrition, training, and racing related, I am hopefully outside doing some of those training and racing things. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist and an endurance coach, and you are here on the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we look at all different types of movement and the people that do them and study them and coach them, and we try and bring those back to things we can apply to our own lives. Yeah, today's episode is with Dr. Stacy Sims, who's one of, I mean, the top experts in the field of heat adaptation as well as women's physiology. You might recognize the name because she's been on the podcast before. She also has this fantastic book called Roar that's all about, you know, every aspect of training and diet and nutrition for women. It's one of my absolute favorite books. I think I've recommended it probably a hundred times at this point. And she sort of coined the phrase, women are not, not small, small men. men. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm super excited about this episode. Before we get into that, though, Peter, what have you been up to? Uh, you know, a little bit of bike skill stuff. We did a big sort of development camp as well. So we were chasing, I think it was like 35 uh, young athletes, sort of in that, it was pretty young. I think we got down maybe into that 12, 13 range up to maybe some 18, 19. Um, and just sort of going through some skills, seeing where people are at and just trying to isolate, you know, some deficits and things that the kids, the athletes can work on and uh, sort of help coaches out. So yeah, I think it was really cool, really cool to see so many young athletes coming up in the area. Sure. And you got to jump into the 24 hour, the summer solstice race. Is that what it is? Yeah, we have a big 24 hour race. I don't know if it's the biggest, um, but it's probably it's certainly one of the longest running. A lot of people have been going there for like over 20 years and it's been running for quite a, some time. So always good. Lots of different, you know, people from different parts of the sport. It seems to sort of grab triathletes, road riders, mountain bikers, you know, new riders, elite riders, um, families. So yeah, saw a ton of people. Super good. Busted a few laps. Don't think I got the fastest lap, but who knows. Nice. And while you were doing that, I was down in Niagara at Bike Fit in St. Catharines, which is a super cool bike shop. Uh, the Bike Fit Sunflowers brought me in to do a Shred Girls talk. So had a bunch of girls, a bunch of parents. Um, we, you know, chatted for an hour about kind of all things training, nutrition, racing related. And, you know, sort of went through some of the things I've learned over the years. And, you know, some of the girls had questions about how to structure their training or what to eat before training and stuff like that. So it was a really, really fun day. And then all of the kids got a copy of Shred Girls and a swag bag. So yeah, huge thanks to them for putting that on. And, and they're listeners of the show, the folks that helped yes. sort of bring you down there, which is a big thanks to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also they've been running, like I think kudos are due because they've been running a women's sort of focused group at least for quite some time. Like I can remember probably over 10 years ago and I'm probably misrepresenting that, but mm-hmm. they've been on that doing good work for a long time. So kudos and thanks to them. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you're if you're a listener and you think that sounds like fun having, you know, a, a talk, girls chat talk and, clinic, that sort of thing. Yeah, definitely get in touch with us. We're consummateathlete.com contact page. Yeah. Yes. Trying to do more of those because, you know, they're they're always just so satisfying. I, I think every time I come home from a talk, I have a huge smile on my face, even if I have massive nerves going into them. Uh, I'm always really glad that I, I got to do them. And I'll be doing another one tonight, actually, with the Collingwood Cycling Club. I'll ride with their kids group. And then they got a bunch of books. And all of the young girls in the program get a copy of Shred Girls, which is really, really cool. So, yeah. Lots of lots of stuff going on. I had the biggest run volume week I think I've ever had. So that's I'm still kind of a little exhausted from that uh, coming back this week. But it was good. Lots of lots of trails, lots of hills, um, a few new friends I ran with, and yeah, just a lot of a lot of fun. And you had the realization that you know when you're tired, you're not going to feel amazing, and you have to sort of truck through it if that's the plan. You got to put the volume in if you're putting the volume in, and be okay with not feeling amazing. It's actually one of like I think the greatest things I've learned in a while. Um, I've I haven't really done interval work for running until the last few months, last couple months, really. Like, never, ever. I hate intervals as a rule. Um, so I started doing them in the past month, and I, you know, I've been really enjoying them. And I'm like, oh, okay, intervals aren't that bad. This is great. And then this weekend, I was definitely, 
you know, tired, a little low on, you know, should have eaten more, should have left more time to digest between when I ate and when I ran, all that kind of stuff. So it was a really hard workout. Um, you know, just did not feel 100%, did not finish feeling, oh my gosh, that was amazing. Intervals are so much fun. Um, but I realized that was actually a really important thing for me to do is recognize that, you know, I think I said it to my coach, it's like, not every workout's going to be a banger. Like, it's just not always going to be this amazing, earth shattering, like, oh my gosh, I'm improving so much. Like, you have to have crappy workouts to have good workouts. Yeah, and I mean, sometimes that's the point too, right? Like, yeah. especially if you're an endurance athlete, you know, going long, you know, and it's, you know, or, or you're just training on a Sunday, right? If you're doing intervals on the last day of the week and you haven't had, you know, a couple off days before that, it's, I think, to be expected, right? Yeah, so that's that's a good learning for me. Um, anyway, back to today's podcast with Stacy Sims. We talked about kind of everything. So, you know, if you're an athlete heading into summer training and a little worried about how you're going to deal with the heat, we talk a ton about that. If you're a female athlete with some, you know, hormone health questions, we dive into that a fair bit. Um, we talk about, you know, what happens as you go longer and longer on a ride, what's going to happen at that, you know, 60 miles, 70 miles, Get closing in on a hundred miles, how you might feel, how that, you know, how your eating might be affected, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, we kind of hit like a whole bunch of topics. And actually one of my favorite ones that we talked about was the, um, the body types, the, uh, endo, ecto, and mesomorph body types and sort of what each of those means and then what each of them means for your training, um, which is not necessarily exactly what you'd expect, even if you are kind of familiar with those three body types. And I mean, we also talk about the fact that at some point they just don't matter that much. It's really about doing the exercise and, you know, workouts and training that make you feel good. Um, so just because you're a mesomorph does not mean you're, you know, banished to CrossFit for the rest of your life because that's what you're going to be the best at. If you're a mesomorph who really wants to run marathons or, you know, trying to think of like a really anti-mesomorph activity. Um, I guess that would be one. Yeah. You know, that's, that's totally fine and that's what you should do. Uh, so yeah, it's a really fun conversation. She's always great to talk to, tons of insights, tons of research backing up everything she says, tons of references to research that she's done or others have done. And it's just always fun catching up and seeing what she's up to. Awesome. Well, it sounds like a good episode, a lot of questions that listeners have had. So mm -hmm. hopefully you enjoy that. All right, let's dive in. What the heck have you been up to in the last year? I feel like you've been kind of all over the place. I, yeah, I feel like I have it, and I still am all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what have I been up to? Uh, so really pushing the whole, like, you know, getting awareness that women are not small men is the forefront and educating people about that. And then on the backside, um, starting another company and working with existing partners and doing research and trying to be mom. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so that's Nothing's changed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, last time we talked, Roar had been out for a few months, but it's now it's been out for, what, almost over two years now, right? Yep. Yep. So, I mean, was there, like, were you surprised by the reception? I feel like I'm still hearing so many people talk about it. Yeah. So, I think... Um... It was a time and a place, and it was right to come out, and it, word of mouth kind of drove it. But then I, when I went to Outspoken, the triathlon conference last November, I was talking to the live feisty people, and they're like, we really want to get your message out there. So I, I kind of bit the bullet. I guess that's not really the right way to say it, but I decided that it would be good to hire someone to help me on social media to really push the messaging out there because everyone's on social media mm -hmm. and I can't do it myself. I just don't have the time or the expertise. Mm -hmm. And since they came on board, it's just exploded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like every time I open up Instagram, there's, there's another, you know, thing from, from you with another like really good piece of usable information in a really good bite sized chunk. So they're doing a great job. <laughs> yeah, they are. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, have you, we've talked about this for, God, I mean, probably in like the 10 years since I've known you at this point, we've talked for years and years now about research being done on women in sport. Do you feel like we're 
getting there with getting more stuff done on women in exercise or is, is there still a huge disparity? Oh, still a huge disparity. Mm-hmm. Huge. Um, they're starting to really look at it and I'm getting more and more papers to review that it's specific to like looking at women, but the scientific design still isn't quite nailed down. Um, so some of the research that's coming out is good research and then others just same sameness where they've washed women into a, a study with men or they aren't controlling for the menstrual cycle or they're not controlling for the difference between like being on an oral contraceptive pill and not. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's still a long way to go. Mm-hmm. But at, at least awareness is there. Yeah. People are starting to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I was going to save this towards the end, but now that you've mentioned the oral contraceptives, I think I'm just going to going to dive into this because it's been such a huge thing on my on my mind and I know reading Roar and reading so much on women's hormones I know that the optimal thing for women to do is be off of hormonal birth control, but I mean, you know, it's it's not that realistic for a lot of us that are trying to avoid the whole getting pregnant thing. Um, right, right. So, like, right. I have the, you know, and I've, I've tried all the different uh, options over the last decade or so, and, you know, now I have the Skyla IUD. And, I mean, to me, that's been, like, the best option, but I feel like there's just not a lot being written about what to do when you're on hormonal birth control. Like, what's the best tactics for you? Right. I know. And so, you know, I always go, that is the ideal, not to be on anything. Mm -hmm. And then the realism is, okay, you need something for birth control for the original design, like not to get pregnant. And then you have to look at your health parameters. It's like, um, do you have really heavy bleeding or are you sensitive to estrogen? So then those would be big reasons not to be on a combined pill. Mm -hmm. Um, then you can go on the progestin only mini pill that has the least systemic effects, but it still is a powerful birth control. And then if you can do the IUD, then that would be the best option mm-hmm. um, because then you're not having systemic hormone release. It's a localized dose. It changes the, um, the texture of the mucosal lining of the cervix, makes it inhospitable to sperm. So it is another powerful way of um, being an actual birth con- birth control me- method. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, when you're on an IUD, you still have your normal hormone fluctuation. You just okay. don't have. So you can still track, mm-hmm. you know, you can feel your mood and, and you can track things. Um, so it, it still is a more natural if you can use it. Mm-hmm. I guess you do in that same context. Mm-hmm. More natural means of, of birth control if you're using an IUD. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's super interesting. So if someone, because I know a lot of people who use the IUD, but that then they don't bleed anymore. And I apologize to all of the, the men listening. We're going to get to topics that also appeal to you guys too, but bear with me here. <laughs> um, <laughs> when, uh, when it comes to that, I mean, how do you how do you know where you are in your cycle? Can you use the thermometer and like, track basal body temperature throughout the month or how do you know because I feel like that that yeah. knowledge is so important yeah so because you're not taking a synthetic progesterone or progestin um, your natural progesterone is, is thermogenic and that's what drives your core temperature up so you can use basal temperature as a means of tracking um, I mean and then the other thing is you can go get blood tests mm-hmm. right you can see what your estrogen progesterone ratios are. Um, and then if you don't want to get blood tests, then you can do temperature and your mood. Cause even when you're on an IUD, you'll be like, Oh, I feel a little bit like bloated and, and you might get some PMS symptoms without, mm. without the actual bleeding. Um, so again, it's more understanding where you are and biohacking yourself. So, mm-hmm. you know, tracking for three months, looking at, mood versus training, um, symptomology, that kind of stuff. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember last time we talked, you know, I hadn't really quite thought about how important where you are in your cycle is to how you perform in exercise and, you know, what the best workouts for you to be doing and, you know, how to kind of be planning around that are. And it was such an enlightening thing to realize, oh, okay, like there are times of the month where I'm going to be better at doing this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it is empowering once you know that. Then yeah. you can start 
really dialing in your training for your physiology. And so you're not in that male scope of three weeks on, one week off kind mm-hmm. of thing, right? Because you think about all the training programs that are written and how they originated, and they weren't taking into account different hormone perturbations that women have. Mm -hmm. So when you start tracking your own cycle and how you feel, um, then you can really go, oh, well, you know, I'm going to do this intensity VO2 workout at this point because I know that I can get the most out of that workout. Mm -hmm. Or uh, I know that around ovulation I feel really flat, so maybe I'll just do a long, slow distance ride or work on some technique or something. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be that same scope of in this one week I'm going to do this, in this one week I'm going to do that. Yeah. Um, So you can change it up. Yeah. I love that. Um, All right, so zooming way out, is there any research that's happening right now that you're particularly excited about in any field, not just specific to women's health? But I know, I mean, heat training is such a huge thing for you as well. Hydration, obviously. So, yeah, what's new and exciting that you're stoked on? Uh, I'm really interested in um, the pollination of gut and genetics. Ooh, yeah. And how that impacts impacts how much... um, I guess, nutrition you pull out of the calories that you eat and how that affects your mood and your recovery and body composition and how you metabolize drugs and all that kind of stuff. It's really interesting Uh, because if you start layering that over what a normal athlete does, you can really hone in on what they need when and how they're going to recover and, you know, with the traveling things and it's just, yeah, it's really interesting. I think all of that's super fascinating, especially because, I mean, if you think about 10 years ago when, you know, we kind of just thought, oh, if you just write down what you eat in a day, that's, you're, you're good to go. You've, you've cracked the code. That's like the maximum right. data you can possibly have. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and you need to lose weight, so you eat a little bit less. We mm-hmm. know that's not true now, which is, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, I feel like since I was like nine years old reading, you know, my mom's family circle or women's day, it's, you know, 500 calories <laughs> less a day and you'll lose a pound a week. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, yeah. I think it still pops up in some of those magazines. For sure. Around, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's imprinted uh, in my brain for forever at this point, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, true. Oh, so bad. Um, and then are there any trends out there right now amongst athletes that you just wish would just go away? Yes. <laughs> uh, how many times do I have to say keto and low carb, high fat? Like, it's oh. awful for women. And it's such a, like, I encounter so many people every day. like, I'm doing keto. It's like, really? Are you <sighs> really doing keto? Or are you just, yeah. So You're like, is there a wall I, I can go bang my head against? <laughs> Right. I'm like, oh, because it's, again, it's like they're, and it's the fitness industry and the nutrition industry that's notorious for this, where we'll take research that's been done in a clinical population and it has results in that particular clinical population and then pulls it over to the athletic. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, like with intermittent fasting and with keto, the research doesn't include exercise. Mm -hmm. And we know, like with intermittent fasting, Exercise works the same way, right? Mm -hmm. So with keto and it's just, it's like leave the clinical stuff there. And then if you want to apply something from the clinical population to the athletic population, do the research on the athletic population and Mm -hmm. include the food and the exercise that they're doing. And then we'll talk, but just don't pull it over. I know. And I feel like even with, with keto, even the anecdotal evidence is not there, really. Like, no, it's... No. Yeah, it's fascinating that it's and it's stuck around longer than I expected it to, I have to say. Yeah, same. <laughs> and then I'm looking at some of the resources coming out on the because it's been around a long time for like nutrition science sake in the fitness environment. They're looking at now the longitudinal effects and they're saying, you know what, it, it's increasing the LDL. It's increasing um the fatty acids in the blood that contribute to atherosclerosis. So actually it's not good even in the athletic environment. So yeah, it's like, but people don't want to hear that. People don't want to listen to it. 
No, yeah. people, you know, we, we all want that magic bullet that's going to make us, you know, magically leaner, faster, stronger in the next week. And it's very tempting when something says it can do that, right? I know, I know. Where I'm like, you need to eat. Yep. Get, don't get into low energy availability. Yep. Cause that's the problem. You're an athlete, and it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, and you get into low energy availability, you're not going to be able to perform, you're going to put on body fat, you're mm-hmm. going to feel awful, you're not going to recover, and it's not about cutting calories to lose that weight you're putting on, it's about eating more. Mm-hmm. And people are like, what? Huh? I need to eat more. I'm like, yeah, you do. You yep. need to eat around what you're doing, right? Yeah. Yep. I think this is actually the first year for me where I started training more for ultra running. And I was like, okay, I guess I actually need to eat during training runs now. And it was a very Yay! confusing moment for me. But, oh my gosh, as it turns out, you can go a lot harder and faster when you're, you know, eating and fueling your activity appropriately. Right. right. Exactly. Shocking. If there's any time... If there's any time to eat, it's during exercise when your body needs it. Exactly. Um, So I have this interesting question, and I know you you tackled it a bunch in Roar. Um, The three body types, ecto, endo, and mesomorph. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you explain why those body types, I think, even just matter as an athlete? And also how to tell which one you are, because... If you give me, like, the picture of them, I will definitely self-identify with the wrong one. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I will figure it out <laughs> eventually. Yeah. Um, so we'll start, like, I don't know who really falls squarely in the middle of just one. Okay, so that was the other mix. thing I wanted to ask you is, yeah. yeah, like, how black and white is that? It's not. It's like a lot of athletes are in that, you know, they're – they have some kind of ectomorphic area, so that's the like the really skinny, can't put on much weight aspect. And then you also some athletes will have more of the mesomorphic, so they put on lean mass really quickly. And you have others that are more of the endomorph that put on body fat rather quickly. Mm-hmm. So most athletes tend to gravitate uh, on those two cusps. Um, unless you're sumo a sumo wrestler, then you're more mm-hmm. endomorphic, <laughs> mesomorphic at the bottom of the scale, right? Um, but I think the best way to look at it is when you watch the Olympics, right, and you're watching the best of the best in that particular event, then you see what body type gravitates for success. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that's what fascinates me about watching something like, um, well, you know, because I'm in New Zealand now, rugby's everywhere, but watching Rugby World Cup. And mm-hmm. you can see what the optimal body type is because all of the teams at that level tend to have the same kind of body composition and, and shape for each of the positions. Mm-hmm. And the same as the Olympics, if you're taking swimming and you're looking at who's the best freestyle swimmer or you're looking at cycling, who's the best time trialist. And the body shapes are very similar at that top level. Mm-hmm. And having um, that particular shape is kind of the dictator for success. Mm-hmm. Um, so because the bell curve gets smaller and smaller and smaller at those top levels of the success. And I describe it kind of in my lectures. It's like you couldn't take an NFL player and put them on a rock wall and expect them to be successful because their body somatotype is not geared to having them be successful as a rock climber. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't have a rock climber jump onto the football field because their body shape, size, somatotype is not appropriate for being on the football field Mm -hmm. so it's that's how it how it affects your success in sport but it's not to say that you can't choose your sport and try to be successful as you can be in that but when you're looking at the elite performance it does have a big drive in success Mm -hmm. Um, so running is kind of a really interesting area for me for this because I find in ultra running in particular right now I'm noticing that it seems like there's kind of both ectomorph and mesomorph that are at that top Mm -hmm. level, which I think is really interesting. And I think it makes sense, right? Like an ectomorph, you'd have a lot more problems with the repetitive stress and stress fractures and stuff like that. And then mesomorph might not be quite as like long distance oriented, but they're muscly enough to like stay healthy through it. Yeah. 
And I think when you start looking at something like ultra running, you need to be super strong. So mm-hmm. that's where the mesomorphic part comes in. But then it's also looking at hip angle. So if you look at the top tier of the female ultra runners, they might, you know, some might be super powerful looking and some might be really tall and lean looking. But if you look at their hip angle, like from the hip to knee, very narrow. And that mm. that is an indication of success in running because then there's less stress in the knee and the hip. So it's being very um, economical in their running movement and their running gait. And then you have the layer on of are they more mesomorphic and powerful or are they more ectomorphic and light and lean? And both of those can also dictate success in that sport because you need the power and the strength. That's where it's advent- advantageous to build that muscle. And then if you're ectomorphic and you have very narrow hips and you can be light over the terrain, then you can last long, too. Oh, okay. I love it. Um, So I was wondering, could we go through the three? Because I find this just so interesting and fascinating. Could we go through each one and talk about, I guess, like what you're most suited to and how you can make that body type work for you or like the things you should be particularly aware of? I mean, I know Mm -hmm. all of them have some pros and some cons to them. It's not like being an ectomorph is just like, oh, good, you're just this skinny goddess who never has to worry about a single thing and just floats (laughs) through. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And we're keeping it in the athletic context, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. So um, if we think about the ectomorph, and those are the ones that's like long, lean, long limbs, um, typically seen as like a runner, volleyball player. Um, a lot of times you'll see like um, a high jumper also is oh, okay. ectomorphic. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot of the sports that require you to move your body weight over a long period of, of or a long distance or over height um, because you need to be able to carry the body through that, that repetitive stress or that weight. So the less body weight you have, the, the more it indicates success. Um, but it doesn't mean it's without its issues because you don't have a lot of muscle. Like you can't build a lot of muscle. So you don't have the extra muscular strength for protection of the joints. Um, and the development of power is, is also sort of an issue as well. So it's not like you can be a really super fast sprinter cause you can't develop the muscle for the power. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a lot of times um, ectomorphs can kind of get into a sort of a lazy habit because they're not going to put on a lot of body fat mm-hmm. and that's visible, but they can still not be all that healthy. Um, so, you know, it is that like you have ectomorphs and they're not that concerned about putting on weight per se. So they don't pay that much attention to their diet so they can feel like they can outrun a bad diet, even though they can't. Mm-hmm. So if you look at health, health parameters and, and gut microbiome and that kind of stuff, they're not as healthy as, say, a mesomorph or an endomeso because the body weight thing becomes more of a concern in, in, in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, and this all comes back to how BMI is such a crap measurement for general health. Ex- exactly, exactly. And <laughs> um, And then when we talk about a mesomorph, this is someone who, like, looks at a kettlebell and, boom, puts on muscle really easily. So it can develop a (laughs) a, a lot of power, you know, puts muscle on easily, can bulk up easily, um, and, you know, is really well suited for, like, I've seen in Ironman triathlon the shift of, of body composition and body shape for success seeing more and more ectomesomorphic individuals winning the top tier because they can put on the muscle and have the strength and the power and the ability to do the long distance without breaking down. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you're thinking about, okay, is it ultra distance, it, um, like uh, track cycling or other kind of sprint aspect, you'll see more of that mesomorphic aspect because of the strength and the muscular development. Um and then people are, you know, like if they want to be a hill climber or they want to be a fast 10K runner, it can be a, a disadvantage because, you again, you have the extra weight from the, the muscle that you've built to kind of weigh, like hold you back or, or weigh you down over that shorter distance for speed. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then we have endomorphics, and endomorphics are ones that put on body fat really easily. So this is where people are more careful with their diet and where a lot of times they get into issues because they don't eat enough. And so if you're not eating enough, then you can put on more body fat. And then as you put on more body fat, then you feel like you have to restrict calories. So it becomes like this hit or miss, right? So those, those individuals that I work with, I'm like, okay, well, we are more endomorphic. So it's not about restricting calories. It's about eating and fueling for what you're doing to be able to change your body composition as best as you can. Mm -hmm. And it's not about saying, well, I'm never going to be a fast runner. You can still be a fast runner. It's just within your, your capacity of, of how much extra body fat are you putting on or what can we do with it? It doesn't mean that if you're endomorphic that you're going to look like a sumo wrestler. It just know that you can end up putting on more fat around the hips and the thighs. And so you're being a little bit more careful by getting into the gym and doing strength training to increase lean mass and mitigate body composition um, changes in the negative direction and making sure that you're eating and fueling for what you're doing and really taking care of your gut to make sure that you're getting the right rate ratios to to help offset um the predisposition to putting on body fat yeah exactly and i mean i think that's the point of all of this is just like you can figure out which type you are you can make an educated guess which type you are and you can use that information it's not to say like oh i'm a mesomorph so i'm you know stuck being a sprinter and i could never do a marathon or i'm an endomorph so i'm just naturally not going to be athletic like you can you can exactly. do a whole lot to kind of maximize that stuff, like your athletic ability. You just have to do slightly different things depending on your body type. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it should never be a hindrance, right? Yeah. It should never exactly. be a hindrance. Yeah. And Especially, you, unless you're like in that top tier, like you're in that one mm-hmm. percent who's going to the Olympics, well, then it might matter, right? Yeah. <laughs> but for the rest of us, it's like well, this is my body type and I'm going to do these small little things to maximize my performance in the sport that I love. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you mentioned strength training kind of each for each body type. And I, I know you've posted about this a few times as well. Could you speak to the importance of strength training no matter what sport you do? <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, so... If you're thinking about building muscle and muscle integrity and getting like the muscle fibers firing, neuromuscular strength, all that kind of stuff, it's not just the strength and the movement of the sport. It's the support of the skeletal structure, right? So you Mm -hmm. want to support your bones. The stronger you are, the less impact on the joint with um, running. Um, And even if you crash, right, you're riding a bike and you crash, you have more muscle mass. You're not going to have as big of of a problem recovering because you don't have as big a whack on the skeletal system Mm -hmm. but it's not just that it's like supporting all those small little muscles that might cramp or seize up when you're at your limit and if you're strength training then you're taxing and you're moving in all sorts of different directions it puts stress on the bones so your bone mass doesn't become a problem you're um, increasing your resting metabolic rate because muscle tissue is more active than fat tissue so you're boosting your metabolic rate so you can afford to eat more and maintain or lose weight depending on what your goal is um, and then as we start to get older, you got to think about quality of life because we start to lose the stimulus to build lean mass when we age, regardless if we're men or women. Mm-hmm. It's a definitive hit. It's a definitive hit for women when we hit menopause. I mean, like it's a very strong, like all of a sudden we're putting on body fat and losing lean mass. Men, it's a slower decline. But the more lean mass and the um, stimulus for developing muscle and maintaining muscle integrity that you have, the better quality of life you have in your master's years of racing and even not even racing, just in your later years of life Mm -hmm. from bone mineral, bone mineral density and keeping um, your skeleton intact and strong and healthy, being able to be functionally moving when you're older and not um, bound to a chair or housebound. Mm -hmm. And then as an, as an athlete now, when you're young, you want to be strong. You want to be injury free. You want to um, be able to do your sport in your best capacity and having that undercurrent of strength from moving more than just the direction your sport dictates to you just helps all around. 
Yeah. And I mean, we're not talking hours and hours in the gym, like grunting away yeah. on the Olympic plates or anything. Like what's, what's like no. minimum effective dosage? Um, so like if you're looking for a bit of, of power and strength to help and just doing 10 minutes of, of plyo work, like your body weight can help. Um, and multi-directional movement, counter jump movement, box jumps, kettlebell swings, all that kind of stuff, maybe 10 minutes, mm-hmm. um, 10 minutes, three times a week, not enough to counter the high intensity that you're training for in season, but it is enough to maintain bone mass, keep that neuromuscular um, conditioning going for muscle contractions, keeping mobility, all of that stuff helps keep you injury free. And then maybe on the off season where you're looking to develop more pure strength, that's when you can spend 30 to 45 minutes of uh, actual program in the gym three times a week where you're trying to build pure strength and build lean mass for a purpose. Yeah, it doesn't take much. It's it's pretty amazing. And granted, I say that yeah. as the body type who looks at the kettlebell and like instantly beefs up. But yeah, <laughs> I've, yeah. I've seen it work for other people, too. <laughs> it does. It does. Even if you're someone who's like, I can never build muscle mass. You go into the gym and you lift heavy stuff, then you're going to get that neuromuscular connection where you're going to be able to be stronger and you might not have hypertrophy or big bulky muscles, but you are going to benefit and be stronger. Mm -hmm. Um, All right. Shifting gears totally. We're coming up on summer, which means I feel like it's time we have to talk about hydration again. I know we talk about this like every time we talk, but I think it's it's still so important. And I mean, this is one of those fields that if you look again, 10 years ago, everything was completely different. (laughs) Um, So what's, what's your current stance on how much you should drink biking, running, you know, your usual endurance sport type event on like an hourly basis. Do you have like a rough rule of thumb you're going with these days? No, I never have really been like, you know, you need to dial it in and drink X amount of fluid because everyone's a little bit different. depends on if you start hydrated or not. Um, But, you know, you have the different, I've talked about this before, the different spectrums of like ACSM positions and telling you you need to drink, you know, three to four ounces of fluid every 15 minutes. And then you have the other extreme of the Tim Nooks camp of drink to thirst. And we know inherently that, neither one of those is the right thing Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, the argument for drink to thirst is we are humans and to survive, we need to drink. And so we've been doing it forever. But again, they haven't put exercise into the, into that um, equation because when you start exercising, there are lots of biochemical changes that happen that change your thirst sensation. So, you know, the general rule of thumb is start hydrated and you can do that through eating watery fruits and veg, salting your food, putting a little bit of salt in your drinking water so you absorb it. And then when you're on the bike, um, you're sip, sip, sip all the way through. So it's never uh, uh, like you have to finish X amount of bottles per hour because, Mm -hmm. again, everyone's different. You just want to stay on top of sipping and sipping and sipping, not to be gulping or guzzling, but you're trying to slow the rate of dehydration. You can't stop it when you're out out slogging around for hours but slowing the rate of dehydration yeah i love uh i love that you just mentioned salt it's uh salt is sort of my like number one vice to the point where we just uh, we ran a girls camp with ellen noble back in march and i just saw one of the campers this past weekend and she brought me a giant container of salt as a present (laughs) (laughs) this is the happiest day of my life (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, I got I got out of the pool and went home this morning, and my six year old daughter greeted me with a salt shaker, going, "Mommy, I want to put salt on my toast like you do." I'm Aww. like, "Oh, not in the morning." <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, so I'm, I love it. I'm right there with you with salt. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect. Um, so you mentioned the staying hydrated beforehand, and what about uh, just as it heats up in the summer? Do we need to be drinking more, or are we just going to kind of know when we need to drink more, or do we need to drink colder versus more? What's what's the right answer as it gets hot? So during exercise, you need to drink more when it's hot. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, if you're drinking cold stuff while it's hot, you're also going to help mitigate that core temperature rise. Mm-hmm. It's just a combination of 
you have to drink a little bit more. And if you can get it cold, it's better for you mm -hmm. from a performance standpoint. Yeah. And then you, re you really want to think like during exercise, you can't stop dehydration. Everyone dehydrates. You're yeah. just slowing that rate of dehydration. So when you're not exercising, this is a time to rehydrate and like your protein shake helps you rehydrate because protein helps with rehydration on all body spaces. Mm -hmm. and, and then again, not being afraid to put a little bit of salt on your watermelon and your tomatoes. Um, like cold salted watermelon on a hot summer's day is so yummy. One, oh. you're going to absorb some of the fluid, but two, it's that salty sweetness that really helps, you know, it's good anyway, but it helps with that whole like thirst sensation and helping you hydrate. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the summer, if you live somewhere that's hot and you're sweating on a regular basis, don't be afraid to salt your food because you need it to pull fluid in. Yeah. Oh, I love it. That makes me, that makes me the happiest. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as far as cooling strategies go, I know this is the time of year where all of the athletes start going a little bananas on trying to stay cool when they're when they're working out or when they're racing. And I mean, we've talked about the danger of the ice directly on the body, but can you can you quickly talk through what's a good idea for a cooling strategy while you're training? Yeah. Um, so part of like this time of year where it's just now starting to get hot for you guys. Well, we woke up to winter today. So oh, I'll that's right. On that <laughs> I'm very sorry. Uh, oh, thanks. I'm very jealous. <laughs> Memorial Day is coming up and I'll be in the middle of winter. But anyway, it's adapting to the heat. So, you know, when you first go out, um, it's going to be hard. If you can sort of alter your training to on these days where it is getting um, hot and you don't want to be out at noon when it, you're not used to it yet, right? So if you can back it up and go first thing in the morning and then gradually get that heat exposure, you're going to acclimatize the heat. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you are actually training in the heat, it's, again, drinking a little bit more, having it cool, having it cold, because it's the enthalpy of heat. It's ingesting that cold stuff that's going to have a, a good whack on your thermoregulatory system. The external cooling of trying to put something on your skin, on your head, it, it backlashes because you cause that constriction, which pushes the hot blood back into circulation and drives the core temperature up. So you want to think of ways that you can do the cooling from an intrinsic way. Like what are you ingesting that's cold or cool? Because that's going to help draw heat out of the body. Mm -hmm. um, just because, you know, something that's cold will draw heat into it to try to have an equilibrium. So it helps pull more of that core heat out of the body if you're ingesting stuff that's cold. Mm -hmm. um, so it's that, you know, it's that getting used to it by doing small doses of heat exposure in your training. And then if you can't change it because all of a sudden you have this race and it's super hot and it's like, what can I have that's cool or cold? Um, and it doesn't have to be ice cold because if you're taking something in that's, you know, 70 or, or 75 degrees and it's 90 degrees out, it's still that gradient, right? 75 yeah. is generally room temperature, but it's cold compared to the 90 that you're racing in. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is true for anyone other than me, but I definitely get very hiccupy. The cold, like if I have very cold water and I'm running and I start drinking, I get like mm. that weird, like hiccupy situation. So for me, yeah, like that 70 degree, I think is, is kind of the, the key temperature. <laughs> not too cold. Yeah. Not too cold, but cool to the touch. Yeah. And so yeah. this this season, it feels like ultra across the board is getting really popular. So whether it's ultra running or we're talking about these long gravel grinders. So the longer the race gets in the summer, any suggestions for how to get through those last hours, whether we're talking hour like four to five in an ultra race or like hour, I mean, heck, like, you know, 17 to 18 in some of these gravel or ultra events. Mm, I know. I feel like I'm ahead of the curve. I did ultra running way back in the day. That's when it wasn't right. That popular. You did it before it was cool. So, I know. I was a geek doing ultra running and that's cool. Oh. Um, <laughs> so when we think about like the ultra, ultra distances and it, it, running is a little bit different from cycling because you have the, um, the load from running, right? Mm -hmm. So that's going to shake everything up, but you have to 
think about it that your body is not static, right? So what you do in the first hour from a nutrition and food point is not what you're going to be doing in the sixth hour, what you're going to be doing in the 12th hour. Um, again, because your body is slowly dehydrating, your guts are becoming a little bit more sensitive. You're not going to be able to digest food as quickly or as fast. And you're going to have times when you hit a, a very huge lull and you're like, I can't eat or drink anything and just know that you're going to walk through that, right? So when you hit those lulls, it's not about trying to force feed or force fluid down because it's not going to work. It's going to make you sick. It's about, okay, I'll take a glucose tablet and just to raise my blood sugar enough to keep me on pace while everything's settling. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that works with running and that works with cycling Um, because, you know, and then you think about also you're not going to exist on on jet planes or or chomp the whole way through because it's just it's just too much of that one type of carbohydrate all the way through Mm -hmm. they're mixing it up right and if you're training and you'll know your lulls and sometimes you'll be like i'm five hours in i really need a piece of pizza well then you know that well maybe i should be eating some more real food with salt on it maybe i need a squishy pretzel at this time or you know so it's like learning your body as you're training what are your cravings when are your lulls so then you can map it out because that last hour shouldn't be the one where you're like oh my god i just can't finish it it should be I have these lulls, I know what to do, I'll have a little bit of glucose tablet, maybe I need a flat Coke, maybe I just need um, to suck on uh, the salt off the pretzels. So because you've been training through and you know how your body changes through these hours, you should be able to tailor your nutrition to match what you need and how your body changes over those hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely found the last race I did, there's absolutely a lull in there. And then there's like a bit of a panic and then you you move through it. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's going to be fine. Um, I meant to ask you this earlier, as we were talking about hydration, and this still kind of applies. um, Do you ever have athletes do the, the scale before and after exercise to see how much weight they're losing to hydration? Is that helpful at all? Um, I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, and this comes from the research background, knowing that it's not the body weight change is not just fluid, Mm -hmm. um, because you're breaking down glycogen and so you're losing carbohydrate as well as water. You don't know what the residual is in the intestines and stomach that's making up weight or not making up weight. Um, And so, you know, you have all the pints a pound, the world around, which is forever drilled in my head if you've ever gone to an ex (laughs) phys class, right? So, you know, and it's not um, because it's not a really good indication of what's going on. And men lose more fluid than women. And part of it is um, overall fluid, but part of it also is our our fuel makeup, right? So women will tend to use more fatty acids. So they're not losing as much glycogen. That's part of like, part of the why they that our body weight doesn't come down as much. But mm-hmm. they're still could be just as dehydrated as the men, whereas the men are losing glycogen and body water and then get you know, so it's a metric that's not so fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um and so that's why I'm like, yeah, you've got to go on a couple of things. You have to go on urine color, body weight change. And if you have pee sticks using urine specific gravity, because mm-hmm. one metric isn't enough. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you said that about body weight, because frankly, for me personally, and I feel like this is true for a lot of people, getting on a scale before I go out for a run pretty much just guarantees that I'm not going to eat enough during the run. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, yeah, I know. And it's very much an endurance athlete thing, and it's not just sex specific. I mean, people are like, oh, women are so concerned about calories in, calories out, but there are so many male cyclists and runners that are like, I can't eat that, it's going to make me gain weight. Yeah. So, yeah, it's that, it's that mind F, because yeah. we're live. Yeah, right. right. So, it's like, yeah, it's not, it's not jumping on the scale and you're know, like, oh, I'm going to run poorly today because I'm an extra kilo or I'm mm-hmm. an extra pound heavier. Like, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I will say I I actually can't tell you the last time I was on a scale. I just don't mess with that anymore because I realized there's never going to be there's never going to be a time where I get on and I'm psyched because if I hit whatever like magical number that's in my head, 
it's just going to make me panic that I need to stay at that number. So right. there's, there's right. not really a good happy ending there. I, no. I, so what do you, what do you go with these days? What do you recommend athletes measure with, like measure with anything? Cause I mean, at some point we have to, we have to keep track a little bit, but is there a better way? Yeah. For hydration or for body weight or for, in what way? Uh, for body weight. For body weight. Um, you know, to keep track and to keep, so I'm now on the spectrum where I'm working with people who are trying to get out of low energy availability because it's such a common thing, oh, especially yeah. the endurance athletes, right? So I'm always working on trying to increase calorie intake in and around training. And I look at more body composition. I don't look at weight on the scale. Like mm-hmm. you're doing, there's a study that just came out. So, you know, the in body system that's around that a lot of gyms and places have it's pretty on par with the deck and you can keep track of what's going on from a body composition standpoint not a body weight standpoint but some people still feel like they need to get on a scale and i'm like well if we get on a scale it's once a month after the same amount of training on a weekend on a monday morning um so that it's consistent all the way mm-hmm. through but if you're inherently going to put on weight you'll feel it in your clothes first right mm-hmm. and you'll start feeling a little bit lethargic um, and in my spectrum now where women are putting some weight on to get hormone balance, even if they, you know, they come from an underweight and they put a little bit of weight on intrinsically as an athlete, you're like, oh, I feel awful. But you have to look at your performance, right? Mm-hmm. So from my end of the spectrum where you're starting to put some weight on and it's lean mass and you're getting more glycogen and you're recovering well, your performance goes up even though your weight's coming up a little bit. So it's like, what are you doing? Why? What is it in the body weight? Are you trying to change? So most most athletes have that idea in the scale. I need to be X amount of pounds in order to perform well, but they're not really tracking their performance versus their weight. They just right. have it in their head. So I try to pull away from weight on the scale and look more at performance and body composition. I love that. Yeah, I think there's this weird mental game that we play where we say we're we're just trying to lose weight for performance, but then we like honestly are really more focused on the number on the scale versus the actual is my performance getting better? Am I going up that hill faster? The answer, right? Ra- I think the answer is rarely yes when that's your your line of thinking. Exactly, exactly. And now, you know, with the big push of getting in the gym to get strong and put lean mass on and and to be strong, to be injury free, weight on the scale is not a metric to be using Mm -hmm. because, you know, you you get in the gym and you start putting weight on. It's functional. It's functional weight. It's going to help you go faster. It's going to help you improve your performance. But if you're just dialing in weight on the scale and the weight's starting to come up, people freak out. Like, Mm -hmm. what? No, I've never weighed that much in my life. Okay, but we know that your body fat is low and your lean mass is high and look how much better you're performing and how you haven't gotten sick and you haven't broken down and you haven't broken a bone. Um, so, yeah, it's even more fodder of why not to use body weight on the scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really cool the amount of research and, you know, experts like you and we had Danelle Kabush on talking about Red S, uh, like last month and it's so it's so fascinating and I'm so glad that it seems like people are finally talking about it and that we're finally away from calling it the female athlete triad and pretending that it doesn't happen to guys right I know although like let's let's say now people care more about it because we've stopped calling it the female athlete triad and now it's it's everybody probably probably it's still a little bit taboo in the male athlete because you know, they don't want to say I'm energy deficient and I have low testosterone. Kind yeah. of how it was taboo for women to say, oh, uh, you know, I've lost my period mm-hmm. or talking about periods. So there's still a lot of awareness and education to be done in the male athlete part. Um, but it's interesting when the coaches and the dietitians and stuff that are working with the athletes become aware of it because then they can have those conversations. Mm-hmm. And then increasing the food intake in the men and all of a sudden they pro- start performing better. And they're like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> wow. um, so I think <laughs> the buy-in for the men might be a little bit easier to increase calories and your testosterone comes up. Who doesn't want that as a guy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so the buy-in on that side will be easier, I think, than the buy-in that has been on the women's side of things. Definitely. Just the cultural drives and the social drives. Um, yeah, so we're doing a couple of studies here that 
Um, we're doing some transdisciplinary work. So one of my colleagues is a very well-known sociologist and, and does a lot of cultural stuff in extreme sports and female athletes. So we're looking at the interviews that she's doing with female athletes versus the, the fizz side of things that I'm doing in female athletes and the low energy stuff. And when you're matching the drive and the cultural nuances to the recovery plan, the buy-in and the recovery is awesome. If you're just looking from one spectrum, then there's not much there. Oh, that's so interesting. I'll be really excited to see how that all shakes out. That stuff is, yeah. oh, that's fascinating. Well, we're presenting it next month at the Female Athlete Conference in Boston, our first first year and a half of the study. So then oh, the cool. publication will come out after that. But yeah. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. I've been following yeah. more I've been following along with more like women in sport conferences and it's been really cool seeing, you know, all of the different stuff that's coming out. There's one in London in June that I would love to get to at some point. So maybe maybe next year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Next so, year. So many conferences, so little time. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Um, all right. Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I know you have a billion things on the go, but let everyone know where they can find you and, yeah, where they can follow along with all your stuff. Oh, so now that I am on social media officially, mm-hmm. then my all my social media handles are the same. Um, so Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of those are just Dr. Stacy Sims. So you just put it all in and finally. Yes. And everyone, I've said this a billion times, everyone needs to read Roar. I think we, every camp that I've had with girls, I've pretty much forced them all to download it immediately and start reading it while they were there. And it was actually great. I got to hear them, you know, at breakfast talking about it and they were all learning a lot. It was awesome. Nice. Nice. Fantastic. I still want to do a little bit of an update, but the menopause book will come out first. Ooh, exciting. I mean, I hopefully, know. hopefully not something I'm I'm thinking about for quite a while yet, but it'll be it'll be good to have as a resource when that time comes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. You can you can use it to help your older masters athletes. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Well, as always, Stacy, it was amazing chatting with you. I'm so glad we managed to find a chance to do this. Yeah, thanks, Molly. Awesome. It's been fun. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Uh, You can check out my stuff over at theoutdooredit.com or by following me on Instagram and Twitter at Molly J. Herford. And you can check out Peter's coaching, training plans, blogs, all that fun stuff over at smartathlete.ca or by following him on Twitter and Instagram at Peter Glassford. And if you want to support this show and other awesome podcasts, please check out WideAnglePodium.com for show info, other podcasts, bonus content, and to become a donating member so you can get all of that rad behind-the-scenes content and help keep shows like this on the air. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast and all the information that we're bringing to you every single week... Uh, do us a solid and pop into iTunes to leave us a rating and review. It takes you about two seconds. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your phone. And it really helps us out. Thanks so much. And we will see you next week. 